So who remembers the formal portion was uh, Stephanie Fu's descriptions of violent childhood too shocking? Well, I didn't there was include one... the mom's part. <laughs> I had one question about the second to last excerpt that you played um, mm -hmm. when she was describing her dad driving her somewhere in the car. Car terrorism. Point. Yeah. And she said that something about when they fight like this, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, so you're admitting that you engage in fighting with him. And this is a repeated thing. You fight with each other. I found yep. that bizarre. Frankly, it, it stood out to me. Like well, it, the fixation is the mother that was the source of the of the rage. So then, the father gave some to her, and then the the mother divorced the father <laughs> and married someone else and abandoned them, and then they shit talked the mother, <laughs> and that lasted a couple weeks or months. Then they started fighting amongst each other. <laughs> yeah, tag teaming and. Divorce in the mix, that sounds, yeah. Uh, this is the uh, mother's whippings that she described earlier in the book. My mother whipped me a lot. She whipped me for not looking her in the eye when speaking to her. But if I looked her in the eye with too much indignance, she whipped me again. She beat me for sitting with one leg up on the chair, like a tri shop puller, or for using American slang like, don't have a cow, man. Once, she beat me for half an hour with her tennis racket for opening the plastic covering on her People magazine after it arrived Tennis in the mail. Racket. Sometimes the beatings would be mild. She'd use her hands, chopsticks, my toys. Other times she would wail on me with a plastic ruler or a bamboo cane until it broke. And then she'd blame me for it. You made me do it because you're so stupid, she howled. Then she turned her eyes up to the ceiling and screamed at God. What did I do to deserve an ungrateful, useless child? She ruined my life. Take her back. I don't want to look at her ugly face anymore. A few times a year, my mother would get so tired of me that she decided God should take me back forever. She grabbed my ponytail at the top of a flight of stairs and used it to hurl me down. She raised a cleaver above my wrist, or she pulled my head back and pushed the blade into my neck, oh, its cold one. edge pressing Sorry. into the softness of my skin. <laughs> I'd apologize frantically, but she'd scream at me that I didn't mean it, to shut up before she sliced my jugular open. I'd fall silent. But then she said I was never repentant, so I'd start to apologize again, and she said my apologies were worth nothing. Double Plus bottom. now my tears made me so ugly she was certain I had to die. So I stayed quiet until she screamed at me to speak again. We'd sit there trapped in a senseless loop for hours. Time to People often ask me what it was like to grow up with this kind of abuse. Therapists, strangers, partners, editors. You're telling us the details of what happened to you. They'd write in the margins. But how did it feel? The oh, question always feels absurd to me. How would I know how I felt? It was so many years ago. I was so young. Feeling and self-reflection is a luxury when you're getting non-stop physical abuse. Because enmeshment, real physical pain, creates no boundaries. So then you merge with this timeless haze of disorientation. So people that get lost in the story, they have the luxury of containing the pain in the story and calling it a trauma story. But just pure chaos <laughs> means you lose yourself in the pain and then you lose yourself in the mother's pain that comes at the end of this recording. But if I had to guess, I'd say it probably felt fucking bad. <laughs> I probably hated my mother for being impossible to please, but I also loved her. And so I guess I must have felt guilty, too, and frightened. After the beating was over and the berating stopped, though, it was easy. I just turned off the flow of tears and stared out the window. Or I went back to reading a Babysitter's Club book. I put it all behind me and moved on. But what was I supposed to do with those feelings? Catalog them? Sit there thinking about them all day long? Tell them to my mommy and expect sympathy? Please. My feelings didn't matter. They were pointless. If I felt all of those soft, mushy feelings... If I really thought about how messed up it was that my mother threatened to kill me on a regular basis, could I wake up and eat breakfast with her every day? Couldn't could I live. sit on the couch at night and cuddle her to keep her warm? No. 
If I took up all that space with my feelings, what yeah, space right could I maintain for hers? Hers were more important because hers had greater stakes. So this is the flooding example. She shared it perfectly about the space at the end here. On a regular basis, could I wake up and eat breakfast with her every day? Could I sit on the couch at night and cuddle her to keep her warm? No. If I took up all that space with my feelings... See? Your feelings take up space. So in a genuine trauma, PTS flood, or physical abuse, you lose concept of your space, you get flooded by the other person's space, or you self-erase, and then feelings and stories don't matter, they just don't exist. Because you lose language, but not only do you lose language, you lose your own personal space. And also you can escape, so her trauma is not just trauma, it has a bit of DPD, DPDR, derealization, depersonalization. So you can see how she's describing the trauma from a depersonalized state. And she might not be diagnosed to recognize that she doesn't just have CPTSD, she probably has DPDR, DPDR, depersonalization, derealization. What space could I maintain for hers? Hers were more important because hers had greater stakes. And then one of the uh, earlier newbies at, in person, Gia, she talked about having DPDR where she would just get lost in time and sort of witness this sort of separation. So your body can d dissociate to levels of depersonalization, derealization. So your sense of reality gets in this in-between floaty space. And it's not that different than non-duality uh, awakening experiences. Shen, Shen Zhen Young has a video describing how DPDR and enlightenment has the same experience, but a different narrative. <laughs> you're just awareness. And if you're trying to be awareness and it's all positive, that's fine. But if you're in awareness and there's chaos going on over your body and you're in trauma, then that, <laughs> and nothing feels real, then that's a bit destabilizing. This is really helpful because I was wondering, I thought there might be a link between that non-duality stuff and the other stuff. Like I yeah, seemed one... wired for it already or something. Pre what? Pre, like I was ready for it and it's easy for me. And that's, that's probably, yeah. Yeah, this is an expert excerpt from her dissociation. I... I think it had some DP or DR traits. This is a minute and a half. It was ridiculous that it took me 16 damn hours to figure out that I was upset, and four more to ascertain why. Why didn't I figure this out sooner? <laughs> why did it take so fucking long? <laughs> Could I have wasted less time and spent less energy being upset if I'd identified my feelings and moved on? If I'd acknowledged these feelings earlier, I could have asked for the attention I wanted. But instead, I felt that hollow, dry, fine feeling. The same feeling I had when I talked about knives to my throat. The same feeling you get when you have to stop crying, pick up the rag, and finish cleaning up the soap. The silent, soundless expanse. Maybe you can't... Silent, soundless expanse. Infinite space. Awareness space. Mm, vast emptiness. So sometimes when people talk about mind chatter, sometimes I've shared like, all you have to do is just go into pure terror. <laughs> it's just nothing. <laughs> what are you guys worrying about mind chatter and doing all these meditation practices? Just dive into pure terror. What? That's a shortcut to quiet your mind. What? <laughs> Stop talking to yourself and just dive into pure terror. People don't get that. And hide in the desert after all. <laughs> I may not have United States of Terra levels of dissociation, but it's now clear I do have my own kind of dissociation. Tamer and perhaps more dangerous in its subtlety. Because up until now, 
I've been able to ignore the fact that it even existed. Weeks later, I found a journal entry from my sophomore year of high school. I think there's something wrong with me. I'm jaded. Like, super jaded. I kind of wish I could feel again. I wish I could be genuinely happy, like I used to be. I don't feel that anymore. I even wish that I could be depressed. Scream at the world, stab myself in the chest angry, like I used to be. But I can't feel that either. When all of these terrible things keep happening, everything should have fallen apart. But it didn't. It was like I was watching it all through a glass. It was a movie. So that, watching it through a glass, watching it through a movie, is sort of an observer state or a dissociative state. But I think it's getting towards the DPD, DPDR, depersonalization, derealization. And diving to the story or addressing the trauma is sort of if your spirit is just sort of out there <laughs> and then you're doing a, a story to contain the trauma, the spirit has to connect with the pain, <laughs> has to connect with the sensations before you create the story. <laughs> then you go to therapists who can't contain just raw affect, <laughs> so then she's just getting lost in the noise. But I'll get a better feel at that by the end of the book on how her... Um, her therapy journey went. Because the trap of therapy, or one of the things I'm learning from the book, is there's so much focus at containment or this fragile thing. It's missing that there's a natural, there's a very resilient part of enduring pain, torture, sadistic rage that's just part of being human that's part of human history <laughs> there's been tons of abuse tragedy child killing murder viciousness that's been innate in our dna for tribal years and just pure survival instincts and by definition since we've survived that means all of our lineage were survivors enough to propagate So that innate wisdom of just raw uh, recovery and just survival, enduring all kinds of fucked up trauma is within our genetics. She even shared some weird thing like a, a statistic where parents who had like famine during 13 to 18 or something, some teenage range. Their kids li live longer by like 5 or 10 years. <laughs> but on the flip side, therapy is looking at like, oh, trauma is like uh, inherited. So we're going to look at Holocaust survivors. Their children have like more hypervigilant telomores and they're inheriting the extra worries and risks. They're looking for the weak parts of <laughs> human survival genes and genetics and they're not as much research at saying, oh, what's the resilient part? What are the weird quirks of how much uh, suffering humans can endure? Or how much can humans can turn suffering into learning? So how much is suffering that breaks you forever? And how much is suffering that you can recover from and you can grow and be transformed. So is trauma and suffering an endpoint? Or is it a doorway? Is it an initiation? And then, yeah, the trap. If you do the moral trap, you say never again for the murderous rage, you make a guilt judgment, and you just hang out in all this mental definitions and rejection in this life state of just rejecting and if you're rejecting your your trauma which could be an early initiation
you're rejecting the the call as far as uh, the doorway down into the your hero's journey or the doorway back after you've gone through the trauma And that's a part of seeing Stephanie with like uh, therapist interviews. I'm seeing the therapist jump to define stuff prematurely for her. And I'm seeing her defer to the therapist and all these other people explaining shit to her. Where the therapists don't have the same level of trauma that she physically endured. <laughs> so they're intellectualizing and explaining stuff, taking away her voice. My opinion. Or she's just being a docile student, so the therapist is just a new mother that's telling her what's happening. Gaslighting her. She's found a new gaslighter. A new yeah, the one, that, mm -hmm. the, one I, the one I saw, yeah, he pretty much was saying that he would recommend that if somebody got to the level of his trauma, he would tell them to move on and find another therapist. It's like, okay. <laughs> it's a weird weird way of thinking about it but well that might be a little more honest hmm but how do you it's not like how they do you list find a their, new one? yeah it's not like they list their drop level or something it's it's not something you can just figure out well if trauma is an initiation in the old days you had a council of elders And the Council of Elders would be able to hold space for trauma rituals. And then you had a Council of wel Welcoming Elders to welcome you back after the, the initiation of the trauma. So that could be a way to hold space. Hmm. Michael Mead is a storyteller in a mythic... Uh, Mythology, storyteller, um, that sort of soul space. And she, he talked about doing trauma workshops and just sort of winging it with rituals and stories and fireplaces and nature and all this stuff. And then he wasn't sure if he was doing it wrong or not. So he found like a couple trauma therapists to make sure. <laughs> And he had done a couple and they worked and they're fine. <laughs> but once the trauma therapist came in, they freaked out like, oh, you're breaking all these rules and all the stuff. And they just, so something that was working fine flooded the trauma therapist's comfort level. <laughs> and they ended up getting in the way and just blocking the process. So a process that he naturally had to use group dynamics and maybe <laughs> hold rituals and hold space helped that, helped that trauma get healed totally against uh, a lot of therapy principles. <laughs> See, like in Africa, rituals, group energy, earth energy, welcoming earth energy, ancestor energy, and just let Mother Earth hold the space instead of having one person or whatever do the work. We have Zoe back. The live watch thing turned out to be a fail because it was a recording. <laughs> we felt, I felt we were, I was abandoned and ignored because none of the questions were going through. <laughs> so now we're going back to Stephanie Fu's book about extreme physical violence and or there's a part in the later in the book where she talks about the aunties and all the other extended family members in Malaysia <laughs> who called her the favorite one when she was living in Malaysia, but they all saw the violence and then they, that's why they were nicer to her. <laughs> so they knew this. The mom was crazy. 
but they knew if they interjected to the mom, the mom would actually beat her more, <laughs> or beat the father more. So the mom had the greatest crazy will. <laughs> so the other aunties and other, I guess the mom's sisters and cousins, they they just watched in horror and just played it, played like it was nice. <laughs> Because her level of physical abuse is not... I think it's still on the minority of Chinese culture. Chinese culture uses a lot of emotional damage abuse and corporal punishment for specific things, but the stuff she was getting was just the mom was just dumping her shit on her. And it was just crazy. <laughs> but she turned out to be successful at... Uh, she got a job at This American Life podcast executive director in her 20s. Book author and all this other uh, journalist stuff. So that she was able to tr take that raw terror, that big shame, and turn it into pro productivity. That's where if she just judges her raw shame or judges her parent, she's rejecting something that she's turned into something productive or uh, financial in her life. Also, if she rejects it, she has no identity. That was part of the critique of the CPTSD books. There's only like 10 pages at the back that tell you something of how to create an identity. Well, that's another bonus to non-duality, that you're allowed, you're encouraged to shed your identity. Identity is yes. destroyed. So yes. it's like, oh, sweet, <laughs> nice bonus. Yeah, I, I, I really embraced that part personally. Um, yeah. Well, I tried to embrace that part. Then I asked about the social part to Jackie O'Keefe and then she interrogated me <laughs> and then she said oh wait you're different you need to go heal your ego <laughs> then after you heal your ego you need to go back to non-duality to to erase the ego so that's what that's the advice she gave me <laughs> after aggressively interrogating me in front of the room <laughs> It's like, what do you mean this? And why does this matter? This is, this is <laughs> social belonging and social something. What's the balance? Uh, it feels like I'm off. I, I, she couldn't get that. She described her shame pretty good. And the boyfriend giving forgiveness was kind of touching this part. She called her shame the dread. Only then did it feel as if I could exhale the tornado of bees that had been thrashing in my lungs. Only then could I exhale the thing that I called the dread. The dread. The dread arose when I was editing a tricky radio story, or I said something irritating at a party, or I admitted to a friend that I didn't know where Persia was, and she grimaced and said, Iran. Like I was a tier one dumb fuck. It seemed as if other people might be immune to moments like these. They somersaulted through their failures and ended up on their feet. But when I made a mistake, the dread crept into my field of vision and I couldn't see anything except my mistake. For an hour, maybe even a day. Still, usually, these moments could be cured with a gulp of whiskey and a good night's sleep. <laughs> Then there was something larger, your solution. <laughs> seemingly random hours or days when the dread swelled and became profound, like an enormous dark shadow lurking under me as I treaded water. I thrust my face underneath the surface to name the source of this dread, but surfaced only with the usual guesses. I must be lazy, or I'm making mistakes in my career, or I'm spending too much money, or I'm a bad friend. And then I worked as hard as I could in a dozen directions in order to satiate the beast. Always, always, I tried to be good, 
But when the dread was at its most terrible, no matter what I did, I was never good enough. Never the great good black enough. dread started to ruin everything. I didn't know how else to feed it, what it wanted from me. I cried at random moments during the day. My hair fell out in clumps. And I wondered if I should distance myself from everyone I loved in order to protect them from me. See, that's true toxic shame, where you realize that your stuff bleeds on others, and then you don't want to bleed off others. So instead of sadistic joy, where you're trying to keep yourself blameless, there's a self-awareness of your trauma or your damage, and then you self-isolate to protect others. That was part of my trauma. So I recognized that when I shared trauma to others, people broke down, so I self-isolated to protect others. That's the definition of toxic shame. Well, this is more of like Chinese toxic shame. A lot of Chinese people get so flooded, or Asians, by toxic shame that every single tiny mistake triggers the threat of all the shame collapsing on top of you. <laughs> because it's a shame culture. So they've been trained by their parents that if you make one mistake, it leads to shame on the family, <laughs> shame on your teacher, shame on this. And then you're just supposed to figure out how to navigate all the saving face dynamics, which in the Asian culture, you have more help. But a lot of the second generations that come to America, they get the shame expectation, but American culture doesn't teach you how to save face and how to navigate shame dynamics. So. A lot of Asians are hyper um, scared of their form of toxic shame, that they're hyper uh, docile at work. <laughs> they don't go into leadership. They're great workers, but they don't assert themselves. They play it safe because they're crippled by uh, Asian flavor of toxic shame. But the second half of the, this audio has a clip of how she sort of got a little bit of a window. Because the dread told me that I was on the precipice of fucking everything up. That one day, very soon, it would strike, and it would take, and it would kill. Oh, it's like, uh, for my shame, there's a sort of this feeling of impending doom. <laughs> That's just always close by or around the corner. <laughs> it's just this feeling of impending doom that's just around you. Oh, seems like Westerners don't have as much of. So, of course, I buried my crazy deep down inside and pretended I was the marvelously sane girl of his dreams. Three months into our relationship, he looked at me funny and said, I feel like I still can't put my finger on you. What? What's wrong with me? I don't know, he frowned. But I'm sure something is. I still don't really know what's wrong with you. Something's missing. What are your insecurities? What makes you anxious? I want to know you. The good and the bad. He what's sat across the couch from me, boring holes into my head with his intense stare. But what if you learn that you can't deal with it? What if you hate the bad? Then it's helpful, isn't it? If we decide we really hate each other's flaws, we can move on without wasting our time. Tell me what's up so I can actually answer that question. You really think you want to know? Well, here it is. First of all, I have an abandonment complex, obviously. My mom left, my dad, and everyone else. Yeah, I got some friends in similar situations. It's really tough. I hope you understand that none of those losses were about you, though. Sure, whatever. And I need constant reassurance. I'm really insecure, and I have a really hard time trusting anyone. And I sometimes get really involved in work. At the end, he absorbed my feelings in silence for a minute, and then nodded. Okay. Is that it? Yeah, sure. What do you mean, yeah, sure? I mean, sure. That's doable. How do you know? Maybe it's not. I don't know. There's a lot of trauma and abandonment and anger around here. Your issues are solidly within my wheelhouse. Thanks for telling me. It's good to know, and I think we can make it work. But maybe you'll get tired of it. I mean, I'll still work on my shit, I promise. Sure, See and I'm glad shame. for that. Thank you, he shrugged. But, you know, it's okay to have some things you never get over. 
It's okay to have some things you never get over. This part. In the span of half an hour, this man whom I had known for less than a season did what nobody in my life ever had. He took all of my never. sins and simply forgave them. He didn't demand relentless improvement. There were no ultimatums. He asserted that I was enough, as is. The gravity of it stunned me into silence. Joey was the opposite of the dread. It's okay to have some things you never get over. It's okay you have some things you never get over, so that's accepting your brokenness. That's sort of the level of self-forgiveness or surrender to a higher power to get it out of your hands, which is the guilt trap. Taking the path of healing and loving in your hands and giving it up to higher power. Say, I'm broken. And maybe I won't heal. But that was hopeful in the earlier chapters. I'm sure the boyfriend started questioning his nonsense in the later chapters. <laughs> She was using a different framework of crazy. Oh, PTSD, abuse. I got friends with that. Then you got to see her acting out her mom's craziness. <laughs> so I was tracking my heart rate um, this meeting, and mm. it was pretty, pretty, pretty good. But every time you like, pretty, pretty stable, pretty baseline. Every time you um, you played one of those those clips from that audio book, um, uh, my my heart rate spiked over thirty beats per minute. Thirty. Uh, jump, yeah. Listening to those clips, yeah, like thirty thirty five beats per minute. That was um, that's what it felt like. I mean, it felt intense, and then but it was nice to have some empirical feedback <laughs> confirming it. And then, and then the clip would end and it would just drop back down quickly. But then you'd play another one and it would spike up, spike again. Yeah. <laughs> well, part of her delivery is accurate, but part of it's probably the emotional part's missing or something's off. Yeah. <laughs> or was it mm -hmm. too intense or something? But the details seem accurate. It was it something off in the... Or did it have like know. the dissociation, right? The DPDR feelings, because I don't have that level of personal, physical, extended torture to, to relate to. But Chantal was also nodding her head during some of the, the audio clips. It's accurate. And it's that um, split off in observation mode. <clears throat> I do the mm. same, because otherwise, there's no sense making. There's no way to deliver the message of what was going on if you're not dissociated. I cannot tell that story because all my language is gone. If I mm -hmm. go back into first person, my language goes off. Oh, so I need oh. third person. Mm -hmm describing and more not emotionally um, flooding. I don't think the emotions were off. It was just more descriptive. Uh, awareness. It was, yeah, it's 100% it's true what she was telling. <laughs> I could feel everything, so... Do you think that she has a better capacity to describe it? Because yes, she has much better than I have anyway. Maybe she has more third person point of view instead of first person. First person might be limited to describe. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Pure chaos. Yeah. I don't know exactly what's, but she has this amazing overview. 
-hmm. And then she has the capacity to find specific words that are so accurate in describing exactly what's going on. It's like, wow. <laughs> it makes me feel normal. I, I really, really appreciate these descriptions. It, it, oh. it's, it's a kind of acknowledgement to, yes, this was real, this was true. I think she talks like that the same way in her, like the American life, which I heard. That's her way of talking. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, you know, when I'm, like when I was like dating my ex boyfriend, he would hear, like, listen to it all the time. And it, it annoyed, annoyed me. Really. Like it made me nervous and stuff. Her way of speaking or? He, um, the the way she was talking was basically about trauma of different different kinds of trauma like war and whatever. So she was very like disconnected from it, not like a regular interviewer that would like emphasize empathize or whatever. That's the DP DPDR. So third person and pure trauma sometimes puts you in a depersonalized state. And I'm not sure if that's just trauma, but it's probably a combination of trauma and Asian culture, which sometimes puts you in more third person or collective point of view. I've gotten critique because I'm people try to talk to me personal and I just say, my norm is not being personal. <laughs> and then if I'm talking about something heavy and somebody wants personal soothing, then they want containment through personal soothing, so they'll actually abuse me <laughs> and rush me and push me and expect me to meet them at a personal, personal level. Or <laughs> it's not natural to me, so I'm actually at the shapeshift and I'm shapeshifting for them. But it's not. It's not good enough for them, so they'll shame me more. <laughs> so this is the cultural uh, colonization of Western culture. <laughs> First person, this is how you hand handle trauma. Then she's flooding the book with all this intense trauma. And then the people who wanted a personal narrative or a bow and whatnot, that's just a different way of processing information. And I think she's going to go through that with her therapy process of going through different therapies. And the therapist is trying to create a, a story or fix her story. And that's not what she needs. <laughs> yes, that's invasion again. Because these, these therapists, they want something from you. They want to feel like they're helping. They want to feel like they're competent. They yes, don't want to be embarrassed them. also in front of their client. Yeah. yeah. Never about the one who's paying, <laughs> in my experience at least. It's kind of tragic. <laughs> I like your approach because there's never invasion of space. Oh. I will work on it. No, don't. <laughs> I like space. Well, yeah, that feels yeah, that feels like a violation for me. Yeah, it's hard to do for other people. Yeah, I start shape shifting if I sense that. If I sense the need that I need to conform. That's my form of compliance. And I start shape shifting. The, in the inside, I'm defined because I, I hate it. I'll oh, see. Inside, you're defined, and that's driven out of hate. Yeah. So, this balance of compliance and defiance, I, I'll try to find better language, but I think, yeah, the argument that that's our codependent sadistic drive. Or murderous rage is 
presented sideways through compliance and defiance. Yeah, because I I never could resonate with the resentment issue. Yeah, see, I I didn't feel that at at all. My rage was murderous rage. Yes, that's what I feel. And I really would love to have that yes, axe and shred someone. Oh yes, that's real. Yeah, that hatchet story was yeah uh, something else. Yeah, I would, oh my God, yes, I would pay for that. This visual, which I don't use so much in person, or on Zoom, to try to advocate, the goal is to build a healthy ego. Try to balance out your cold state and your hot states. Oh, oops. No visual. And try to avoid the unconscious guilt. That was me putting guilt here. And the unconscious sadistic drive. That's where I tried to cover today's meeting. Jordan Peterson calls the unconscious sadistic drive as you have to own your malevolence. Or you have to own your you have to become your own monster, so then now you can defend yourself and you can uh, temper your sadistic and monster side. You can sheath your sword after you know how to use your sword. But if you reject your sadistic side, then you can't defend yourself and then it comes out sideways. I think this part's really good, but it's too simple. So if you focus on never again, you're fixated on pain. And where your attention goes, energy goes and it and grows. So you're actually creating more pain by fixating on pain. And then the process of avoiding never again and pain, avoiding pain is you nick your gain, your aim, positive gets invisible. There's just no space. But I like how ISTDT sort of put murderous rage in unconscious sadistic drive as the two uh, parts of resistance, the two drivers of unconscious uh, resistance, compliance and defiance is unconscious guilt, and the unconscious guilt is because of the unconscious sadistic <laughs> drive. Why would you disown sadistic rage? I mean, that makes no sense to me. But I have a high sadistic score for some reason. It's it's also easier. It's easier to to um, not find it so frightening when you're not a parent, maybe. Because when you're a parent, you'd better be disowning or you know <laughs> not embracing your sadistic rage too much, right? Oh. Well, if you have a lot of unprocessed sadistic drive, so then it blasts and takes over. Um, or if you have a lot of space, I don't, I haven't, my niece is still sort of, yeah, still young, but I would be intimidated by her raw impulses. <laughs> Because I would, be, I have more sensory space awareness to sort of see her just pure, <laughs> and I see her parents sort of freaking out over her crying and stuff. So she's just at this pure nonverbal state. Maybe when she gets more verbal stuff, there might be a different dynamic. <laughs> so when you say owning, you don't mean you, you're not endorsing acting it. You're just. Encouraging acknowledgement, 
recognition, giving space, but oh. not not acting. Well, I didn't have it in this chart, but ultimately you need a healthy morality. Maybe that'll be Thursday or future meetings. So to rebuild your moral compass means that you have moral values that you enforce, but you have to have the self-discipline to live by whatever the hell you're enforcing on other people. So if you have that, then you don't really have to worry as much about your murderous rage coming out and whatnot. Because it seems like my observation is people somehow love the opportunity to morally outrage against others so they can dump their sadistic rage outward. <laughs> And from a Chinese cultural value or a Confucian standpoint, that's being a bad person. And that's highly shamed, <laughs> actively looked bad upon. So. Uh, you're not just making yourself look bad as a bad person. You're making your whole family look bad as a bad person. You're just like breaking all the taboos if you were to. to throw away your principles and be shameless. But in Western culture, apparently, if you can be in moral outrage, you can be shameless and vicious and no one, people give you a pass. So if you have your morality balanced with principles and self-discipline, where you're consistent with your enforcement of others, then you're consistent of being, uh, recognizing your humanity and having mercy towards yourself, towards holding yourself to higher standards of behavior for yourself, not because of other people seeing you, because you want to be a good person. So you don't hate yourself because you want a clear conscience. <laughs> so if you have a clear conscience based on your own personal path, or at least a somewhat clear, because your conscience is still going to be annoying, but, <laughs> If your conscience is, has a decent relationship, then you aren't going to have an excess of sadistic revenge and unfairness <laughs> that you're going to dump it on the people and you're just, oh, I'm fucked up and you'll, you'll cause damage because your sadistic joy, your murderous drive, your competitive instinct is going to be balanced out by your morality. But ultimately your morality and your sadistic uh, drives are in the background because you're navigating reality by a healthy ego. This is reality and your shared humanity and your soul is sort of leading your life and then morality sort of just helps navigate your conscience and your collective ethics and then you'll have space to be playful with your sadistic side to play out gain and pain and flirt banter or you can tie yourself up and do stuff that Laura's probably doing based on her journal post that she already shared it <laughs> her kink side or whatever she's doing. But we're, we're right to worry about sadistic supply or sadistic drives because a lot of it's a murderous rage. But it's a murderous rage because you've absorbed your abuser's murderous rage. Or you have, you know, murderous rage toward yourself, self-hate to try to abandon your inner child. So it's a giant bomb of danger that can harm others. Yeah. That's reasonable. And society doesn't let you express it. So you added more shame on top of the murderous rage. So it's... It has to be contained aggressively because it's just out of control right now. But if you had more space and more self-discipline and more... Uh, Pragmatic morality. 
or lifestyle morality. So some people use their moral compass by um, too many rules or too many stories. Where Chinese culture sometimes would say you have a, your lifestyle contains your morality. So then you don't need to remind yourself of all the rules because your lifestyles and your habits and your routines and your community is giving you reminders of what your morality and how you should live. Dangerous for the exile. Well, in IFS terminology, and Stephanie Food does some IFS therapy in the book, I think, is that if your murderous rage is an internal persecutor, like uh, Lee Hammock talked about his superego, a lot of rage and anger, if that turns into an external protector, pretty much the same job, but instead of trying to, to keep the exile trapped, now it can protect about other dangers. So that's where you're taking your your disown uh, capacity for evil and being a monster, and then now using it to protect from external monsters. So a persecutor, firefighter part, can get converted into a protector part. And it might be useful for society. So not only can you protect yourself, you might have a nice competitive drive. You could fight psychological battles or sports battles or be articulate uh, communicator or something. That's could be a social pl social value, creative expression that's being uh, underutilized, trying to protect the exile. If the exile gets integrated, then the persecutor's got no job to do. <laughs> so now the persecutor can do something with creative expression if the exile is integrated. There's no... Or the exile might be integrated and the persecutor is still protecting something that doesn't even need protection. Persecutor might just be angry at you for not reassigning. <laughs> well, this is a high level teaching, which is tricky. That I covered this in person at the last uh, library meeting. That there's something called procedural memories. So there's implicit memories where you remember something like a recording or a scenario. But then there's procedural memories like riding a bike, or you go into an environment and then you listen to music and that takes you to a certain place. So there's behavior actions that can remind you of a certain memory. So when your emotional flashback triggers you into a defense, when you get triggered and you, you act out the defense spontaneously, I would make an argument that that's a cellular memory. That's sort of how trauma is stored, especially trauma that's pre-verbal or trauma that you couldn't make sense of or sadistic type trauma. But this is tricky to accept or to even consider. All defenses are memories. All defenses are memories. I'm just letting you register that, right? All defenses are memories. If a patient detaches from you, a patient oftentimes is showing you how someone detached from them. If a patient attacks herself, she's oftentimes showing you how she was attacked. Or she's showing you how she learned to attack herself in order to maintain a connection. If a patient projects and splits, oftentimes the patient is showing you how she grew up in a home where there was splitting and, and projection. So keep in mind, the defense is always a memory of adaptation. Every defense is a way of relating to you, and every defense in a way is an enactment of a kind of relationship with you. The defense is always a memory of adaptation. 
So in the past, I've shared that if you want to reverse engineer someone's wound, what you do is you trigger their defense, their primary defense, and you take in their abuse as much as you can surrendered. You don't want to block you just want to absorb their attack. And when you absorb their attack, you can reverse engineer of the pain. And then now you know their, their pain point. So when I posted the 30 day challenge or when I kicked out of the 30 day challenge, I didn't fight back directly against Richard Bannon. And I didn't try to just slander him. I tried to, I absorbed some of that, uh, that pain. So then I got to feel his self torture of how he dismisses himself and how he erases. So I got to absorb some of his core wound because I, I didn't deflect or maybe I didn't have the capacity to totally block his defense. So if you recognize, if you're willing to consider that their shared humanity and that people are even your demonized attackers or other people they're still human so they're act acting out of insecurities because they're human so when they're highly defensive and highly sadistic that comes from a place of humanity it comes from a place of insecurity of wounds so then you can recognize it as a memory of adaption or cellular memory, or you could gamify it and try to recognize it as them exposing their wounds so you can now take advantage of it later. But that's just my sadistic gaming side that enjoys the idea, but my moral side of being a good person would not allow me to enjoy the sadistic pleasure. Or it'd be hard. I guess my justice sense, my sense of justice would need to be triggered. And then I would coldly execute revenge or vengeance on them, but I wouldn't have the sadistic joy side of it. So most of my sadistic joy is just ideas. I don't, I'm too lazy to act it out. I think, unless I get pissed off enough. <laughs> but defense is a cellular memory memory so that's why for instance in isolation of affect if the patient takes a detached stance we'll say notice how you put up this wall the detachment and then we would have the same distant relationship here that you have with your wife and that you had with your father so can we see what feelings are coming up here toward me you're beginning to address the way the patient is enacting a past relationship with you it's a patient learned i should attack myself and then my mother will calm down. So when the, instead, when the patient goes self-attack, we'll say, oh, could that thought be hurting you? Could that thought be unfair to you? Could we see what feelings are coming up here toward me if we look underneath those thoughts? Inviting feelings is actually inviting a new relationship. It's blocking an old enactment. Now, this is super tricky. <laughs> so when he's observing the person's defense of dismissiveness and isolated affect. That's like putting a mirror and shoving it in front of the person's face. <laughs> but that's part of his training. He has like these audio tapes where you just go through multiple types of defenses. This is a projection. This is intellectualization. And it's just reps of pr practicing spotting the different defenses and calling it out. But then after he calls out the defense, People feel exposed because they don't, they don't recognize they're defending and they don't recognize that their defense is actually a book, a blueprint of, of their unresolved feelings. It's like, it's hyper exposing somebody. That's where ISTP sort of describes it and they talk in such a boring neutral tone. Because they're just, making you naked <laughs> with your defenses is like brutal <laughs> but then the new thing 
is to invite new feelings so you interrupt the pattern. So if you have a defensive relationship where your defense is to dis dismiss and intellectualize, and if I attack you with compliance or defiance, then that validates your defense. If I respond in a way where you can resist or use willpower, that's what you're used to. But if I were to call it out neutrally, not make a judgment on your defense, but also call it out and now say, what are the feelings underneath? That's interrupting the pattern and using that defense as a doorway to call up the unresolved feelings. This is clever, but like super hard, probably. And that enactment through using defenses is going to cause patient symptoms. If you ignore your anxiety, then that, that would prevent us from being able to regulate. Well, yeah, but I don't want to look at it. Right. Well, if you don't look at your anxiety and I don't look at your anxiety, then, then what kind of relationship would we have if, if we both ignore you? She's inviting you to do that. She's inviting an enactment. That's where we have to keep our attention. So given that you're inviting me to hurt you, can we see what feelings are coming up here toward me? These defenses are always enacting past relationships. Oh, that's good. So what feelings are coming at me? So naturally when your defenses come up, you're gonna scapegoat whoever you're with who's a trigger. Maybe we, maybe that's how nat, how we naturally work. <laughs> so we have a feeling come up, defense comes up, and then we just automatically do the defense to whoever we're around. And that's an easy blueprint. So that's how you react to your spouse or your parent. So then as a therapist or as a friend, you say, what feelings are coming up in me towards me? So then and now you're playing the container. And inviting the person to have a new relationship instead of defending. Now, is there space to articulate? Express your emotion. Inviting it out. And so we're having to think about how do we bring that to your patient's attention? And how do we make sure that our interventions are offering a new relationship rather than repeating the old relationship? So this is taking triangulation and projection and then flipping it into a new triangle. New triangle. <laughs> Break the repetition by inviting the feelings out. And then maybe the therapist is playing the scapegoat or the partner that can stay vulnerable and have the guard down and say, what are your feelings towards me? Do you hate me? Are you angry at me? Are you annoyed by me? where the spouse or the parent or the sibling, they wouldn't do that. They would get triggered to attack back. But in this neutral space of unconscious therapeutic alliance, the therapist plays a container, a limited parent, a limited friend to invite a new relationship to break the pattern. All defenses are memories. The defense is always a memory of adaptation. Every defense is a way of relating to you, and every defense in a way is an enactment of a kind of relationship with you. Offering a new relationship rather than repeating the old relationship. But this is, yeah, really advanced or tricky or something. And this is more of the high ground, but you can use the same thing. If someone's defensive, triggered, you follow the thread of what they're attacking, how they're attacking, and often that's from their wound. That's partially why I, I'm crippled. So I've had, if I had self-hate, then I could use my self-hate, transfer it onto you, dump it onto you, and then motivate you through my projection of self-hate. I could make you jump based on conditional love because I have a lot of self-hate conditional love, but since I don't motivate myself that way, I can't motivate other people from that pain because I can't 
I can't just flood myself with that pain and then just send that in my herbal frequency because I don't have it. I could do like pure shame from a Chinese culture side. That doesn't work with Western cultures. <laughs> So was there some excitement in the chapter, or was that just people that are just... <laughs> exploring stuff with shoes? I wouldn't bring back, like, Nadia's pointers. Right? I'm very scared of them, because I can't insult them, because they don't accept the insult. It's like a black I know. It's like a black I know. Hole. I'm very scared of them because I can't insult them because they don't accept the insult. It's like a black hole. It's like a black hole. I'm very scared of them because I can't insult them because they don't accept the insult. It's like a black hole. It's like a black So when you insult somebody, you want it to land. <laughs> and if it doesn't land, then you have a dissonant feeling, you have a feeling of failure. You didn't get your connection. So is there a choice from the receiving side of the insult person to, to deflect the insult or just ignore it? And if that causes pain in the insulter, isn't that easier than having to give a jab back? <laughs> 